Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Leave the Spreadsheets Behind, Budget and Financial Management Digitization. Uh, my name is Bob Grabowski, and I'm a Managing Director with Deloitte Consulting, um, and I specialize in finance transformations for CFOs. Um, and most notably, I've spent a, a significant amount of time in the past several years working on many digital technologies and, and how they can enhance the lives of our finance officers, our CFOs, our financial management community. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. Uh, we've got an exciting presentation to talk you through, um, and we're going to talk about digital disruption and what that means and how it changes uh, the work that you all do from a day-to-day -day basis and how it's impacted our communities. Um, we, uh, when we typically talk about this uh, uh, topic, there's a lot of discussion around the tools, and we will talk about the tools today. We'll talk about process robotics and RPA and some of the other tools that, that honestly don't get enough airtime. But we also want to focus on the process and how digital disruption is impacting data, the processes we execute, and the life cycle of the financial management components that we support. We've got an exciting panel today. If we go to the next slide, we'll, uh, I'll do a brief intro of them, and, and then they'll all spend some time telling you a little bit more about themselves. So we've got Adam Goldberg, who is our Acting Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Financial Innovation and Transformation from Treasury. Uh, we've got Monica Ellerby, who is the Senior Advisor to the CFO and Director of Business Management Services at FDA. And we have Don Bennett, who is the Chief Financial Business Systems at NGA. Uh, so exciting panel today. They're going to talk to you um, a lot about their experiences with digitization and how it's been impacting the work that they've been doing within the financial management community. Go to the next slide, please. Before we get going, we, we want to get a sense of uh, who we are presenting to um, and where you all are within your financial management digitization journey. So we've got a very basic question here. Um, where are you? Uh, and if you wouldn't mind answering, we've, we've got three choices. Prehistoric, still using clay tablets or, or maybe uh, uh, spread, you know, handwriting and, and the uh, spreadsheets. Uh, modern era, we have Excel and other Microsoft tools. Um, or the Jetsons with robots doing your spend planning, budget execution, and your taxes. Let's see where we have our community. All right. And I know we've got a second or two for these uh, answers to come up. Hopefully, we won't see too many in the prehistoric uh, era. Got a couple in the prehistoric. Awesome. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is showing where we would expect it to show that the modern era and, and, and admittedly, there's probably 13 flavors and, and other items that could come between each of these. Uh, but I think the modern era is where we're all finding ourselves. And it is much more than Excel. It, it's other digital tools that have started to come onto the uh, to the scene. Um, but I think getting to the point um, of the Jetsons or, or truly using digital technologies to influence the processes we perform and, and really impact what we do as a community is where we, uh, we are striving to go. And I think where we see a lot of this going in the next several years. Excellent. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here's our agenda for today. I'm going to set the stage for the next couple of minutes just to, to intro what we are going to be talking about today. Um, and then we're going to quickly get into uh, to hear from our panelists. Um, you know, who have prepared the stories of what their organization is doing um, and how they're seeing the future look for, uh, for the finance community. And then, of course, we'll finish with Q&A. Um, as most of you have already uh, probably done a, a bunch of times, please load your uh, questions into the Q&A. Um, I'll be monitoring them, and, and when the panelists finish their stories, we'll, uh, we'll jump, we'll dive right into to some of the more popular questions that come in. Okay, before we turn it over to the panelists, let's jump to the next slide. Um, wanted to set the stage for today. So, so again, we, I said in the very beginning, when we talk about this, um, this topic, uh, folks jump very quickly to the tools and they, they forget about the process side and, and what the tools are meant to enhance. Um, I wanted to start with a, with a quick overview of, of the predictions for where the finance community is going to be in the next, you know, three to five to seven years. Um, and then we can turn to what technologies are going to enhance getting to each one of these um, areas. Um, so, so first, the finance factory, um, touchless transactions, right, automation, blockchain, the ability for um, the, the most common functions that we perform to be automated in a way that is trustworthy with digi digital, um, with the data being digitized um, and, and the ability to trust the information that's coming out. And, and I think we're getting there. I think we're seeing the, the, the intro of some of those technologies to enhance the finance factory. Uh, the role of finance, uh, and, and I think with, with several of the CFO acts that are being discussed, um, 
this is looking at finance being much more um, as a part of the business and, and providing those insights that are impacting uh, the mission of your organization and, and, and finance being much more of a player in that, not just the folks that handle the money. Um, finance cycles, and, and this is more about finance going real time. And I think you're going to hear a little bit about this in one of the stories this afternoon uh, or this morning. Um, you know, no longer having the wait time on, on dated reporting and um, lag in information and inconsistent data, depending on how you pulled information. Getting finance to go real time, having the ability to pull that information at a moment's notice out of multiple different systems um, is going to make us a more effective community. Uh, self-service. So self-service becoming the norm. Um, we say finance will be uneasy about this, but this is, you know, the customers that we serve, being able to get the information they need, not having to come to a specific individual within the CFO shop um, to ask the question and, and perhaps wait an hour or a day or a week to get that answer. This ultimately will relieve stress on the community and ultimately relieve stress on you all. Um, operating models, and, and this is around new service delivery um, uh, models that are out there, um, just to make the, the finance workforce a bit more diverse, right? Um, this is crowdsourcing and, and um, you know, uh, automation and AI, you know, being able to look at this much more than just financial transactions and how the finance community can become a bigger part of the uh, discussion for the organization. Um, ERPs and enterprise resource planning, uh, the, the, the big vendors are prepared for this, but it, it's combining the digital technologies we're going to talk about today with our ERPs to get the most out of it, right? This isn't a one-size-fits-all, and it doesn't mean you need um, every component of an ERP to work, but you, you need that, uh, that source of truth, and you need the technologies working together. Data, my favorite. Um, data is probably the most important topic that gets talked about the least. Um, and, and I think we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, you know, digitizing data. It, what good is, are all these technologies and this approach if your data is not ready to, to be, um, you know, to be digitized? And then finally, uh, workforce and, and workplace. Um, I, I think uh, about a year ago, we all were thrown into a brand new operating model when it came to where we work and how we work. And I think the, uh, the, finance, or the federal community has done a, an outstanding job adapting to that. And, and that can be seen, you know, in the technologies that are used and, and almost, you know, specifically within the CFO shop, you know, the work that we perform. So these eight predictions are where the finance community is going over the next several years. And, and like we mentioned, some of them are, are here already. Uh, next slide. So I did say um, we weren't going to focus on the tools, but how could you talk about digital disruption without talking about new tools that are out there? Um, I think what, what's going to make this section unique is this isn't the, the traditional RPA play that I think we hear about a lot. Our RPA is taking the finance community by storm. We all know that. Um, we've all probably lived that to a degree. But this is thinking about other technologies like cloud and the ability to, to accelerate your delivery through cloud platforms. Um, advanced analytics, you know, how do you, how do you get to decision level data, not just automation of a process? Um, cognitive support, you know, machine learning, having um, technology that learns and, and helps along the way, you know, getting closer to that finance in real time concept. Um, in memory computing, how do we get information faster? Um, you know, the, the amount of data we have is, is already uh, overly abundant. As we get into more of the digital age and, and data becomes more digitized, that's going to slow our systems and our applications down even more. So in-memory computing is a way uh, to speed that up. So this, this digital uh, revolution that we're in is not just about RPA or chatbots. Um, it's about looking at these other technologies and, and figuring out a way to leverage those as we continue down the path and, and get to that finance of the future. Um, and, and I know each of the panelists will touch upon some of these technologies that they're currently using as well. So before I turn it over and get to our panelists, we have one last uh, 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 pa uh, survey question for you all. Um, and this is one you'll be typing in. So we're interested um, which digital tools your organization are currently using. And, and let's go to the results as, as they start coming up. Um, and, and feel free to reference some of the, the ones we mentioned on the previous uh, slides. Um, digital tools are, are really where this is, where we are going, and, and there's a ton of them. So, so it is far beyond what we've, uh, we were talking about previously. Um, however, you know, those are some of the big ones that I think will impact the finance community. Yeah, so I think we're seeing RPA again. RPA is, is something that, um, it, it excites me. I, I've seen it be used very well, and, and I know it's something that a lot of the organizations are using. Um, and, and I always see it as kind of the gateway to other uh, technologies. 
Excellent. Okay, so we are seeing a ton of uh, of great options up here. Um, you know, Cognos and and uh, cloud and and um, power Power Query and and Power BI. So all of these are part of that digital technology revolution. And I think when the importance is for us to start thinking about you know how this impacts the budget and financial management processes that we are responsible for executing on a regular basis. So with that, hopefully I set the stage nicely and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, to continue this conversation. Uh, let's go to the next slide and we will go to our first speaker of the day. Uh, Mr. Goldberg, over to you. Thanks, Bob, and good morning to everybody. Uh, and thanks to my fellow panelists and the audience for uh, engaging in this discussion today. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar with the Office of Financial Innovation and Transformation, we serve as a catalyst for financial management innovation uh, across the federal government. Uh, I make the kind of joke that we don't perform the financial management processes. We make the financial management processes that you perform better. And hopefully in the descriptions I give today or the overview I give today of our projects, you'll get a sense of how that might be able to occur with you. Uh, one observation before I go to the next slide, which is on the first poll, in terms of whether someone was in the modern age or, or, or prehistoric, uh, one of the things that we've learned is that you don't have to have the most sophisticated tools in your organization to go digital or to automate. Oftentimes, you need to be asking the right questions about the business processes, which is what Bob alluded to, in order for you to really, I think, excel at this. So if we could go to the next slide. About three years ago, FIT uh, undertook a strategy study to look at kind of what the future of financial management would be. And that study had a couple of findings in it, uh, one of which was that there are some emerging technologies like RPA, like blockchain, like advanced analytics, like AI, that we should begin to explore more fully in financial management. The other thing it said was that we should really look at our end-to-end -end processes because that's really where we're gonna drive the savings. So as anyone would do, uh, we chose to start focusing on the nifty technology. And so what happened was we had solutions that we were going out and finding problems for, um, which was fine because it really gave us the opportunity to learn things. But I think we may have sub-optimized some of the things that we've done. So one, everybody has started going out and putting bots together. And I think that's great. Uh, although our measure of that has been how many bots have you stood up? And so in this case, I think what we may be doing is sub-optimizing that technology in our organization. And so what we've done in the last year or so is we've begun to shift some of our analysis to what are end-to-end -end processes, things like procure to pay, bill to collect, apply to replay, book to reimburse, things like that. And look at the whole end-to-end -end and identify where the challenges may exist and where we might be able to apply technologies intelligently um, in order to really drive out some of those savings. And so the concept is not to focus on, well, in this case, it's not just solely a focus on automating things, but it's really on focus on digitizing things because in order for some of these modern technologies to work, you really need to have the information in a digital form. And so we're beginning to learn about automation and digitization and how that's important. So let's go to the next slide. This is a view of what we're calling our digital end-to-end -end, um, evaluation process. And I believe they're gonna be sharing a link where you can go to a draft of a playbook that we've been pulling together. But this is our journey through an end-to-end -end process, in this case, TDY. Uh, we chose it because for one reason, during the pandemic uh, in the organization that we were working with, not a lot of people were traveling. So we said, let's focus on this organization, uh, on this end-to-end -end process. As you look at this, um, the line itself just re represents the beginning to the end of the process. The, the blue icons are representing the major steps. And then you'll see a yellow and an orange that represents whether someone was done, something is done by a customer or a pain point of a customer and the darker color was the pain point of, in this case, the provider of the service or the FM organization. And so what we did is we looked at the various pain points uh, and tried to say, you know, is this something where we can come up with a solution? So in this instance, a pain point is something that's manual. 
it has volume to it and there's lots of people doing it. And sometimes the suboptimization that I've been talking about with RPA is we're not looking at all three of those characteristics to really drive out the greatest amount of savings. One of the things I wanna do is highlight something, I think it's over probably about a third from the left side. Uh, one of the problems that we found was that there was a lot of pain point um, angst related to approving a travel orbiter and making sure it had sufficient funding on it. And in this case, what we did is apply an approach which said, one, is there something I can do first that doesn't require technology to solve this problem? And what we found out was that the, the home organization wasn't putting enough money on the travel orders. And that was requiring that the budget folks go in and continually add money. And one of the reasons they didn't want to add a lot of money up front is because um, they wanted to have greater visibility. And what we're trying to do right now is work with that organization to say, maybe we could put some other mechanisms in place for you to evaluate the spend on this that doesn't require a new technology. And so that's something that I wanna emphasize for folks as you begin to go through your journeys, which is begin to ask whether there are other things that you can do to improve that capability that doesn't require a new technology along the way. If you go a little bit down further, there's another kind of greenish box that talks about email communication. So there's a lot of communication that was going back and forth on email. And in this case, what folks decided was that we are bringing in or the organization is bringing in a customer relationship management tool. And that's something that we could use uh, in order to make that communication more seamless as well as have a record of that communication. So again, my focus here is that not always technology being the, um, the solution to all the problems. One last observation, and Bob alluded to this as well, was that this is a self-service process. And so as a self-service process, we recognize that in the end, this wasn't something that we were gonna be able to draw a lot of savings from because it was largely passed over to, to another entity to do, and it was automated as self-service. One last thing I wanna to touch on is another process that we're reviewing right now, which is the process to create a treasury warrant. And for those who aren't familiar, a treasury warrant is essentially evidence that the, the monies that have been appropriated by Congress are available to agencies to spend. And what happens to create a warrant is that we have a lot of accountants that go through and read this legislation and they manually interpret it and pull out information uh, from the approach language to create the warrant itself. And what we wanted to do was see whether or not we could use other technologies like artificial intelligence to help in the creation of that document. So we've learned a lot of things in this process, one of which is that the language actually, um, the approach language is published in XML, which is a machine readable language. Um, but we learned that one, the timing of when that information was published didn't really allow us to use it in the business process. And two, there was some information missing from that language that our accountants needed today. And so a couple of things that I just wanted to focus from our lessons learned on this is, is one, you really need to, when we're using these digital technologies, you really need to understand the information that you're using and the data and whether those sources are going to deliver what you need from them. And it's really critical in understanding this. The second is that you can't just replicate the existing business process using these technologies. So the example I use is the XML language didn't have the information we needed. One of those pieces of information was a page number because today that's how we reference where, the, where we pulled the warrant information from. Well, in XML, I don't have to generate a page number because it kind of looks like code at the end of the day. And so one of the things that we had to talk to the team about is you, you, you need to make some shifts in using data which is instead of a page number, maybe I could use a line number or some other reference that we could use to support that process. So the couple of the takeaways that I wanted to make sure that folks had was one, um, you need to begin to shift away from tasks and begin to look at the end-to-end -end because that's really where you're gonna drive savings. And things like RPA, I believe you're gonna really be able to draw more um, benefit from those tools. The second is that technology is not the only savior here. 
you really need to one, make sure that you're looking at other options that you may have already or changes to the business. And two, uh, you really need to understand the data and what you're and how that data is structured today and how you're using it in your organization. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Adam. And, and very interesting. I know you, the, uh, hopefully the playbook that, um, you know, has been put out there uh, will, will be very interesting. And, and, you know, leading with the process, not leading with the technology, um, I think is a, a key message we're, we're getting across today. So thank you very much for that. Uh, next, we have Monica Ellerby. Uh, Monica, over to you for the work you're doing at FDA. Okay, thank you, Bob, and um, thank you for my fellow panelists um, as we talk about the discussion today. Um, good morning, everyone else. Um, I'm Monica Ellerby from the Food and Drug Administration's Office of Finance, Budget, Acquisitions, and Planning. OFDAP is responsible for the agency's fiscal management activities and programs. We lead the agency's strategic planning, program evaluation, and the enterprise um, risk management. I serve as the senior advisor to the FDA's chief financial officer and as director of business management services, which supports OFBAP's full administrative functions, including human resources, budget planning, and contract management. My office is also responsible for OFBAP's business transformational activities, which is why I'm here speaking on this panel, which equips each office with access to tools supporting the innovation of our fiscal management activities of the agency. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, before I review the slide um, of our current innovation and those considered for the future, I want to provide you some context and background. FDA's Office of Finance, Budget, Acquisitions, and Planning over the past four plus years has embraced innovation in financial management. We have leaders who are constantly looking to leverage digital technology to reduce manual, cumbersome data entry type of tasks. And internally, we have created leadership development programs focused on the GS 12, 13, and 14 staff because we are thinking about the next wave of leaders who can think outside of the box and embrace digital technology. And this all started a few years ago with creating awareness um, through innovation labs, developing use cases for innovation and automation with our executive leadership. And we all know and can testify about the fact that leadership from the top is what propels an organization forward and lack of leadership renders us stagnant. We in FDA were fortunate to have leaders who were open and embrace change. Um, so I'm going to talk about the slide a little bit and just give you a, just a highlighted view of what we've been done over the last um, um, four plus years. And this has been our journey towards innovations that we're currently utilizing in our organization and those that we are considering in the future. And and currently um, in production in OFBAP, we are using RPA to automate several manual rule-based repetitive tasks, such as status of funds reporting for the agencies and offices, vendor invoicing and payments reporting and communications, interagency agreements and tra transactions and validations and posting. Um, we use cloud-based technology, which allows us to improve customer relationship management, automate forms and increase data validation and workflows. Um, we have machine learning to quickly analyze data and natural language processing and topic modeling to analyze and categorize help desk tickets for faster resolution. And with the agency migrating to the SharePoint online over the last year, we have utilized um, business intelligence tool to create a visually appealing reports and dashboard for our leadership and our customers. So in the future, we are evaluating additional digital tools like all other agencies to in innovate OFBAP's business processes. Um, this includes cognitive computing by introducing intelligent chatbots for frequently asked questions. This will increase efficiency and in responses, freeing up our staff from answering the call and questions from our customers, shifting those man hours to perform more value added tasks to business operations. In-memory computing will also allow staff to run financial budget um, and business reports in real time, giving leadership insight into making organizational decisions at a faster pace. We're in OFBA and it, OFBAP now, we just um, had a rework in FDA. We are very excited about the challenges that are facing us and we are ready and feel that we're equipped and stand in the place that we are um, effective enough to move our organization forward in the mission of FDA. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Monica. Very interesting. And I think the concept of that innovation lab and leading, you know, the leaders being supportive of this, 
you know, not just standing up a technology because it was someone's, uh, you know, brainchild, you know, very interesting. And I think it, it forces you to focus on the outcomes of what you're trying to do, not, you know, the, the technology or, or maybe the quick win. So a very interesting story at FDA, and, and hopefully we'll get some good questions on it. Um, okay, we are going to conclude with Don Bennett. Don, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Adam and Monica for being here. I'm glad to be here. I'm really looking forward to uh, the discussion and the questions from the panel. So um, today, um, interesting, uh, the poll was really interesting for uh, me because I saw how Excel was categorized. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that as I get into my comments. But first, just a little bit about what we do here at NGA and what my role is. So I am the chief of the Financial Business Systems Office, and I report directly to the CFE at NGA. And as part of my responsibilities, I manage the accounting system for the agency, the budgeting system for the agency known as Orbit. And we're going to talk about that extensively here shortly. Um, the ASP relationship, the application service provider, which is integral to our success in our agency, and also uh, system modernization and user engagement, all of which are very important and critical and vital to us being able to be successful at NGA. Now, as I, I talk, as we talk about um, moving forward to progressing with digitalization, um, at NGA, I like to think of us as being ahead of the curve, and that's because we've done a lot of the, the homework and the uh, legwork and um, analysis necessary to make that happen when we deployed our budgeting system years ago, about four or five years ago um, in the agency. And it required us to have to take a good, close, hard look at our data. Without a focus on data, we would have been dead in the water. So our data analysis um, led us to understand some of the um, shortfalls, some of the risks that we encountered, and some of the things that we had to overcome before we could even really get a good, hard look at our processes. So our data analysis revealed that there were um, inconsistencies and there was a lack of centralized control and things of that nature. So we implemented a control environment to make that happen that has really helped the agency to be able to produce um, reliable um, data products that can feed towards data visualizations and on data analysis that's used throughout the agency for leadership to make important decisions. Once we completed the data analysis, we implemented the control environment. When we proceeded on with the deployment of our budgeting system, which we're gonna talk about here shortly called Orbit. And with that system, it helps to feed the right information into our accounting system. It also partners with the user engagement um, community efforts to make sure that the processes that are around the agency are in, con um, in alignment and in agreement with the, the data and the um, processes within the system. So the business processes and the system processes are aligned together. So one of the, uh, the, the main examples that we had um, good success in that was a, a nightmare for us years ago was the linking of accounting data to budgeting data and producing the fiscal file and our budget submission process. So if we could go to my first slide, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So what we had to do is look at the um, four core um, areas of the agency that needed to be addressed, the processes, the technology, the policies, and the people. And in that analysis, we determined that the business processes in some places did exist, but most of them were fragmented and um, didn't meet the need. We also discovered that we didn't have the technology to um, perform the core um, things that we needed to get done um, to meet our submissions externally. We had to make sure that the people were in the right position and the, the grow the people to be able to um, meet the needs of the agency. And then we had to back out all, all that up with the proper policies to make sure things happen. So we focused really strongly on the processes and the technology in the beginning. And with the technology piece, we determined that the accounting system momentum needed a um, I guess you could say a partner in the budgeting system that would feed the proper information to it. So we standardized our user interfaces, we standardized our budget environments and structure, and we established a good strong control system with rigor and validations. And that was key to our success. So now we have the data and it's supported by the business processes that we can continue to evolve. And we're growing the people to be able to get the most out of those, in, those items within the system and the agency. We're also standing up the right processes and, and policies, I should say, to make that happen. The impact that Orbit has had on the agency along with momentum has allowed our leadership to be able to submit our budget submissions, our data calls, and all of our um, items that we submit to oversight without delay. We're, we used to be one of the last agencies to submit those items, but now we're one of the first um, in a row being probably one of the first before us. And the good thing about this, as I mentioned, the ASP, the Application Service Provider Relationship, 
The NRO is our application service provider for the NGA. They run the exact same accounting system and they run the exact same budgeting system. So there's shared uh, knowledge, there's shared um, uh, processing procedures, there's, there's shared experiences. So we work together and we partner to make sure that we're all um, meeting the needs of our oversight, USDI, OSDI, um, ODNI, and um, OMB. So we make sure that we get things submitted on time, which is one of the biggest um, hurdles that we had for years. We're now on um, went from worst to first. We're now one of the first agencies to submit our budget submissions and our um, data calls to the um, oversight organizations. And we are doing pretty well with that. So we're really proud of that. Go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, Orbit. Orbit is like the key. It's the financial um, management budgeting system background. And it's also our backbone, I should say. And it also feeds into our accounting system. It's where all of our coding and all of our data it begins. It is also the system that most of the data that comes out of is used to our by our new group we've stood up just recently. Um, it's called FMD, it's our digitalization group. And it actually takes the data that comes out of our budgeting system and turns it into um, visualizations and digitized products that we use are used throughout the agency to achieve good um, decision-making products for the um, user community. So we have a budget management portion, a resource management portion. We have something called the budget um, budget line item management portion, requirements planning, execution tracking, and program build. Those are all key processes and procedures that happen within our agency. And each of those agents, each each of those processes have a separate set of internal controls and validations that are needed to ensure that they meet the requirements of oversight and as well as our internal need. We also have automated and digitized our comprehensive, with the installment of a comprehensive reporting solution, we've digitized the ability to create our budget request booklet, our CBJB and our CJB, and the narrative process. That particular booklet is now created by pulling information directly from the budgeting system, and it actually um, automates the process, and it takes days and weeks off of the process, and lots of efficiencies have been implemented. So with these six modules and the comprehensive reporting solution, working together with momentum, we're able to be able to take the agency to the next level and digitizing our data. Excellent. Thank you, Don. Appreciate that overview. And, and thank you to all the panelists for giving your perspectives. I think you know, very interesting uh, topics and concepts today. You know, I think Adam with the end-to-end -end framework you talked about, uh, Monica, the innovation labs, and, and some of the, the things that are being done to really look at what, you know, technologies are, are available out there. And then, you know, Don, I think tackling a problem that plagues most financial organizations, you know, connecting that formulation and execution and, and budgeting to accounting process um, and, and trying to tackle that using multiple different technologies, you know, a very innovative approach to doing that. Um, so hopefully this is very helpful for the audience. I know we've got a bunch of questions uh, coming into the poll. So uh, we're going to go through a few questions here for a bit of time. Uh, please uh, don't forget to log your questions. We're going to go through as many of them as we can. Um, and, and one question that I see a little farther down on the list, but, but Monica, I'm going to throw this one over to you uh, to start to kick us off, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, how prepared do you feel your finance organization is to adopt the tools that, that you've been talking about that came out of your innovation lab and, and what steps are you taking to make sure they're ready? Okay, um, thanks. Of course, ladies first, no problem. Um, <laughs> currently, our workforce has predominantly interacted with these tools as end users and we are looking to train and reskill most of the workers, um, so our workforce so that they can serve in the capacity of developers and administrators. Um, we are also focusing on our recruiting efforts to identify and interview and onboard employees with um, technology savvy um, and tech, um, technological fluency. Um, hopefully this will be our um, focus moving forward. This is where we're going and this is where we're moving to. While it's been amazing to have contractors in our space and to provide that input that we normally wouldn't see in the federal space, we definitely want to um, invest in our workforce and identify those skill sets of those individuals who want to do something more and see the problems. Because at the end of the day, it's our um, line staff that is doing the work. They see the issues, they see the holes, they see the problems. And to be able to put them in a position where they can actually learn a new skill um, that is applicable to you know, helping our organization move forward, that's what we want to do. And this will benefit us, benefit us in the long run, run because we end up keeping the knowledge in-house and then we also have the capability to, you know, reskill those staff members. So this is what we predominantly want to focus on. And these are the steps that um, hopefully 
um, will continue to have our organization embrace all the different types of technologies and tools that are available to us. Yeah, excellent. Kind of setting that culture of learning, not, not just diving people into an individual vendor solution, right? Um, right. Very interesting. And, and I know with, um, you know, the, the multiple technologies you talked about in your presentation, Monica, I'm sure that that approach has been uh, uh, helpful and almost exciting for some of the folks. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, Oh, so Don, let's let's go over to you. So, um, you know, one of the things I, I know you're talking a little bit about the budgeting tool that you've developed. Uh, talk a little bit, if you can, about how long it takes you uh, maybe before and after the tool was submitted to do your budget submissions. And, and, you know, how many different phases and scenarios do you go through now that you have this end-to-end uh, -end solution? Absolutely. So prior to our budgeting tool that we currently have known as Orbit, uh, it was done basically with a combination of Excel spreadsheets and an access database. It took approximately about six weeks or so, um, lots of man hours, 12 plus hours a day for the uh, team to do that. There was a lot of manual computation, lots of uh, trial and error, and the submission process to oversight was grueling. Um, very rarely did we make the submission on time. Uh, with the automation of that process, um, the budget submission, as well as the data calls associated with the budget submission, and there's many of them, uh, We've taken that process down from about six weeks or so to within three to four days. Saves a ton of time, cut down on the number of people required to do it. And, and the big reason we were able to do that is because what we basically did is we linked the accounting along with the budget formulation and the budget execution um, throughout the system. So the, the big part of the manual computation of that process was the linking of the accounting information to the budgeting information. Um, now that that's automated and the systems work together to make that happen, it allows the analysts on the back end to do more of the analytical work that's needed to identify areas that um, oversight may focus in on and prepare um, responses for those inquiries, or for us to identify areas that um, our leadership may focus in on and decide to go a different direction. So the automation um, with regard to the pre preparation of the fiscal file or the preparation of the data calls for oversight has allowed our agency and particularly the resource management office and the office of the comptroller and the CFE to be better prepared to respond um, across the entire IC community as well as to Congress on those inquiries. Excellent, thank you, Don. And, and I, I think you may have mentioned it, but there was a question that popped up. What, what is the software uh, that NGA uses for this tool? Yeah, so the software is called, um, we call it ORBIT, it's Organization Requirements and Budgeting Information Tool. So what it basically is, is, is IBM Planning Analytics. And on the front end, there's a software called Angular. And it um, basically allows us to be able to um, integrate and conform the budgeting process to our agency's needs while having it also communicate and talk with the accounting system, mm -hmm. as well as the Office of Contracts contracting system. So mm -hmm. what we've basically done is we've taken that triumvirate of the Office of Contracts, the Office of Finance, and the FM and Budget World, and also the PMs, the program managers, they also have the capability now in one environment to communicate and work together to automate the entire process and streamline all of our requisitions and acquisitions across the agency. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm sure, Don, this will be a very helpful tool in uh, this accelerated budget cycle that we're about to hit, right? Absolutely. It is very flexible. That's the good thing about it. We have the ability to do um, sandboxes and different examples of uh, submissions, um, different submissions uh, um, scenarios that we can put together that allow the agency to be able to determine if we want to do a 5%, 10% or whatever the case um, submission. So, Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Don. All right, uh, Adam, I think uh, there's a question that popped up here around the prehistoric age. Um, and I think you actually touched upon some of the, the uh, lessons learned and, and pitfalls that, that you've experienced. But, you know, what for those that are beginning their digital journey, you know, they are the ones in the prehistoric. They voted prehistoric on the first software or the first survey. Um, what are some of the risks and, and maybe lessons learned that you would provide those folks um, who are just getting started? Sure. I, a couple of the risks is, is one, um, we jump to technology as the solution before we start evaluating other alternatives. Um, again, I think, I, I will say in the original analysis that we did on the TDY travel, um, because we called it digital end-to-end, -end, people came back after the solutioning session and said, we needed blockchain, intelligent OCR, 
Uh, we needed RPA and other artificial intelligence. And I said, well, wow, we're going to have the most amazing, convoluted, expensive process in the world if we put all those things in there. And so one, don't jump to technology as the solution. And what do I mean by that is start looking at the pain points and understanding whether or not there are alternatives to doing it. So let me give a, I gave the one example about budget, but we have another one where um, the suggestion was to upload receipts. We use intelligent OCR to do that. So it would um, take it from your phone and then put it in the right place on your travel voucher. Um, what we learned and didn't understand at the time was that actually with the travel system we use, there already was a mobile app that we could do it, but our IT organization wouldn't let us turn it on for security reasons. And when we went back to them, we found out that we could. So the second is to go out and look at your pain points, but begin to understand business processes, capabilities, policies, again, before you go to those technologies. And the last thing, and I emphasize it as well, is when you start looking at technology, focus on the points like, is it manual? Is there a lot of volume? And are there a lot of people performing it? Because those are the things that are going to drive the greatest amount of savings and benefit for you. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. I think that also, uh, when you started talking about costs and level of effort, that addressed another one of the questions, or at least attempted to address one, another one of the questions that popped up around, you know, balancing out the high cost of automation tools with the low level of effort of manual work. And I think part of your advice, specifically as you're getting started, is don't focus on low level of effort manual work. Focus on the, the places where you can see that return. Because even though, you know, we're talking about process end to end, being able to see and feel that return is critical to, you know, to get the acceleration of these tools within the organization. Yeah, and, and I would add that, like, with RPA, you still got to get your feet wet. So it's okay yeah. to go out and start automating things that are low-hanging fruit to get familiar with the technology. But as you, as you begin to mature, you really should be looking at things that are gonna drive greater savings for the organization. Um, again, I've heard people speak at conferences, you know, they save a thousand hours, 1200 hours a year. In the scheme of things, it doesn't add up to be a lot when we look mm -hmm. at it. So again, the bigger picture items can drive savings if, if that's really what your objective is. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I'm going to jump to the most voted upon question in the in the group, and uh, we'll we'll open it up and let uh, any one of you answer it, and, and maybe all three of you should address it. But the question, there's actually a, a subsequent question later on. So a lot, of, this is on a lot of folks' minds. Um, how do you see CFOs and CIOs aligning on the technology needed to digitize and modernize to get these business insights? So combining CFO and CIO function here. So who who wants to kick us off? I think I'll try and start and I'll go quick so I don't go too much off the rails. This has to be a partnership. So as I said, even in the example I gave with the travel system and you know using your mobile device, our IT organization was the one that said there was a security risk in doing that. And so we need to make sure that those IT organizations are familiar with these technologies and where there are security issues and where there aren't. The other is, particularly when you look at the treasury department, you need to bring that CAO organization in very early. With RPA, I actually had to go through more hoops because in order to do a pilot of RPA, I needed to get into the um, test environments for our applications. And that required a greater hurdle than had I not do it. I had another project on blockchain where we actually did it on the contractor's equipment and that was much easier. So again, bring that IT organization in very early and help them get familiar with that technology and comfortable with how it would impact your organization. Excellent, thanks, Adam. Don, thoughts from uh, you know your perspective on, on working specifically? I mean, I would say you probably interface with, with the CIO shop with this massive system more than most. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's important that there is a partnership between CIO and the uh, uh, the CFO office. Um, and we have that here in our agency, definitely. Um, we work hand in hand with them. I think one of the things we have to be careful of though is we need to make sure that when it comes to your financial business systems, that FM has a strong say in how they are, um, the in architecture of them. And we want to make sure that they are um, 
I should say the resources are appropriately aligned to them. Uh, we don't want to get a part of the big, uh, I should say, um, portfolio where they're just looked at as another system in the agency because they do represent and they have a much larger role, just in my opinion, because I'm an FM guy, but they have a big role. Um, but at the end of the day, the CIO team has, um, and working in collaboration with the FM team and specifically in our agency, the financial business office, we work hand in hand in a lot of things. And there's a lot of transparency. Our leadership has required us to make sure, they want us to make sure that we're transparent and we are, and we have to work hand in hand to resolve some of the more complex things, so. Excellent, thanks, Don. Um, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Monica, I think we, we might have lost. Hopefully, she'll be able to re rejoin us. Um, we, we've got about five minutes left. There's another question in here. There's actually a couple of questions that hit on this. Um, so I'm going to uh, combine them a bit and, and see, you know, Adam and Don, get your perspective. And I think this topic of shared service providers, interagency work, the ability to leverage what we're doing across multiple agencies, it constantly comes up. Um, and I think it's on all of our minds. I think it sounds great in theory. Uh, you know, but very interested in your experience with, with how this actually happens. Um, and, and should there, you know, is, is it more advantageous to, you know, Adam, uh, you talked about automating one or two processes to get some, some momentum, um, or is it more advantageous to look across the organization and say, these are the standard processes across the government that we should be automating. So, Don, you want to kick us off on uh, the thought on maybe shared service providers and your agency work on this topic? Absolutely. So uh, we have a shared service provider um, agreement, interagency agreement right now at NGA with NRO, and it's been in place since 2013. It's actually been uh, awarded a, um, a recognition from uh, ODNI and uh, Congress for the smooth uh, implementation and the operation of it. We meet weekly and we work well together. I, I think it's important um, to note that it's the savings that we have, they go beyond just dollars and cents. The, the amount of time that saved because of uh, working together to troubleshoot troubleshoot um, situations in, um, that happened on um, the financial platforms, whether it be the accounting system or the budgeting system, the, the cross-utilization and cross-sharing uh, of uh, um, solution solutioning issues that um, internal to our agency that may not necessarily affect the other one. However, working in the same uh, application, sometimes there's a familiarity that, you know, th looking at things that we're not looking at that can help us. Um, it's always good to have another set of eyes and another agency that can share in helping to resolve your problems. We don't have necessarily the same business processes, but we have the same system. So we're able to sometimes bounce things off of each other. And we do that very often. So it for us, it is a cost savings, but it's more than um, just that for us. It's also a relationship of having a, um, it's like having a twin brother or sister that you can go to and bounce things off of. So it's a, bit, a good benefit for us. Excellent, thanks, Don. Adam, thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I, it, it's a great question. I, you know, as we start moving to shared solutions, I think um, this is gonna become a big change management challenge, which is how do we get all the agencies to agree on at least a common framework to perform a process? I don't know if I have the answer to that question, but one of the other challenges that we're facing, even in a non-shared service environment, is moving data. And so let's go back to travel. I think folks have heard this messaging point before. I think we have 40, 54 implementations of one of the travel systems and 54 different interfaces. So one, we need to really begin to standardize how we're exchanging this information, not only within with one product, but if there's three travel systems, how we do that with three. And actually within the fiscal service, we've been working on a concept called the business information exchange which would be a mechanism whereby we would create those standard layouts and they would be built in as APIs to the applications that commercial providers give to the government. And so that's one of the criteria that we're looking at for the shared service marketplace for the financial management queues model. Uh, and I think that's really gonna be one of those areas that we need to think about in terms of delivering savings in the shared service world. You know, I know uh, we've talked a bunch today. Um, Adam, you talked about the uh, the playbook uh, link that hopefully we'll be able to go out to this community. Um, you know, Don, I think the the interesting, uh, the, the software that you've been using and, and the ability to connect those uh, components, I'm sure you'll get a lot of additional questions. I actually see some in the Q&A right now that we didn't get a chance to get to. Um, but, you know, I, I just want to say thank you to the two of you for joining today and sharing your journey and your experiences. 
um, it, it's been it's extremely insightful for myself and, and hopefully the panelists. Um, and, and I know Monica's journey at FDA has also been even slightly different than, than what the two of you have uh, seen. And I think that's an important part as we close, you know, that this journey is unique to each organization. And, and while there's overlap and opportunities to, uh, to collaborate, you know, being able to figure out what that journey looks like, um, you know, and, and implementing some of these technologies within your organization and getting that momentum and keeping it going, that's critical. Um, the, the future of finance is upon us and uh, we need to be ready to, uh, to accept it. So thank you to all the panelists. Um, great job today. Thank you to AGA and thank you to all of you for attending our session today.